Hey guys, this video is brought to you by Dev Mountain Coding Bootcamp. If you're looking to get into the IT industry, make sure you give them a look. They're dealing with a lot of the latest technologies, so they're going to be focused on all the technologies that are going to be able to get you into the door quickly. Hey guys, what's up? So in this video, this new tutorial series, we're going to be looking at the latest version of Python. And there's multiple reasons why you want to learn Python. It's actually the most taught language in universities around the United States. Um, it's been growing a lot since 1990 when it was first created. And Google used it as its primary language for its stack back in the late 90s and early 2000s. They still use a lot of Python. YouTube was originally created in it. Um, so there's still a lot of demand for Python. Right now where it's exploding the most is in data sciences and machine learning. It's considered to be an easier language um, than a lot of other languages out there. And there's a lot of math libraries for very complex calculations that you can easily tap into if you're trying to learn uh, or do machine learning or anything like that. So Python has a lot of those libraries out there for data scientists. Um, and typically a lot of those jobs do require like you know, PhDs or at least uh, masters and, and uh, end or bachelor's degrees because you know, biologists and, and physicists and things like that, they would prefer to use Python uh, over you know something you know, m more difficult probably like C Sharp. But uh, you know, Python is also... Um, used all across like servers so websites are, are using python for their stack like i mentioned uh, youtube now as far as like full stack frameworks python has frameworks like django which instagram pinterest was built on it um, and then you have things like flask and flask is now used by um, a lot of different companies for microservices for just setting up like a small api because these days a lot a lot of uh, server-side technology is is on the less and less and we're trying to do more and more inside the browser and uh, that means javascript you're writing a lot of javascript that runs inside the browser but ultimately where is that data coming from that hits the database and returns data and, and makes sure that uh, the request and everything was legit and that's all server-side code and python's a great server-side language for that type of thing so you'll see that python really shines in the web development world as well so Python is considered to be an object-oriented uh, language, although you can procedurally write it. Uh, the difference between that is that in object-oriented languages, uh, there are languages like C Sharp and Java that are fully object-oriented, so you cannot write them in a procedural way. Procedural meaning that programs are read uh, top to bottom, left to right. So just like you'd read a book, um, and obviously you're going to call functions and other files and things like that, but ultimately that's how that, that, that execution is, uh, is, is working. Now, with object-oriented languages, it's you know it's somewhat similar, but there is no everything from the main function of your application. There has to be some sort of uh, class and object stamped from that that class to build your application. Where Python, you don't have have to deal with that. So for a lot of beginners, they, like that that might seem confusing to them, but. Uh, the bottom line is that Python is a very fast uh, language to write and um, because of the fact that you don't have to organize your programs, you can write quick Python scripts that just uh, do all kinds of stuff, for instance. So as an example, I'm a C-sharp developer. I write C-sharp code uh, day in and day out. I could have spun up a C-sharp project, like a console application, you know, with a few clicks of a mouse button, but there's quite a bit of boilerplate code with any sort of .NET project. And what I was trying to do is I had a list of files in here that all these different file names are actually the ID of the YouTube video on my channel. So I have it all in here and I'm like, you know what, I need those IDs for the file name and I need some sort of JSON object so I can iterate through, you know, a list of objects and, and get that ID. So while I could have wrote it in JavaScript using Node or I could have uh, used um, C Sharp or many other languages to do the same thing, I choose Python, even though I've never, uh, I, I've written Python now for eight years, but I've never actually had a job where I wrote Python for a company, which is, um, I, I think it's interesting, but it tells you a lot about, because it tells you a lot about like um, Python as a language itself. It, you know, it definitely has grown on me. I like it. I, I use it for little things like this. So one tiny little script, and this is procedurally written code, um, can read through that list of, of directories there. And then it's um, chopping off the last name, it's, and it's building a, a, a list of uh, objects there that um, you end up dumping to JSON format, or you're serializing it to JSON. And, uh, and then I put it out in this test.json file, which goes into, uh, let me see. So if I go in here and run the, uh, the program name, which was uh, build, actually I don't remember what it was called, uh, 
build videos. And you can see just that quickly that script ran and was executed. And we now have this test.json file. So that's how I was able to generate that uh, JSON object that I ended up putting into, like I said, a constants um, in ES6 so I could export it around and use that data for with, from within my components and everything. So um, that's just an example of why Python is just quick and dirty. It's a dynamic, dynamically interpreted duck type language. So that means by default, like it is just not going to compete uh, on a speed level with like something like C Sharp or Java, which is compiled. Um, however, the amount of time that uh, it takes you to write something like this um, to solve a problem like that, like I wrote this in like five minutes. So I was able to solve that problem of, uh, of building that object based on that, that folder structure. And like, and that's just one particular thing that you could use Python for. There's so many different things, but um, the speed of being able to do that in Python just it, it outweighs uh, any sort of performance hits that you might have using Python. Now, because Python is something called a garbage collected language, which means that Python deals with looking for unused variables and things like that, so it does something called garbage collecting, so it frees up memory for um, memory that was set aside for those variables. Because think, in programming, you ha any sort of variable that you have, it's called a variable because the, the value can vary. Um, and typically, uh, in most languages, you have types for those variables, right? So you, uh, there, there's things called strings and numbers and we're not going to get into all that because this is not a beginner level programming course. Hopefully you guys know about some of those basics, but um, the variable can obviously change. And, and if it can change, then it means that it does take up memory and consumption and things like that for the uh, the programming process that that, uh, that is running. So Python automatically cleans that up for you. But any sort of garbage collected language is, is not going to be as fast as other languages um, that give you full control over memory management like C++ or just raw C. But anyway, guys, uh, that, that's really all I got in this first video. You can use Python for all kinds of different things. We're going to see throughout this uh, tutorial series that we're going to use it for practical purposes. That's the point of this series. Thank you, guys. Bye. So first things first, to get started with Python, we need to go ahead and download it. So we're going to go to the main Python page uh, at python.org. If you just type that into Google, you'll get to this page. The latest version as of the time of this uh, video is 3.6.5. Uh, so we've had a Python 3.6 series for, for, or at least Python 3 series for the last 10 years or so. But Python goes back a long way. So like the original Google Foundation was written on Python uh, 1 series. And then like when Python 2 came out, a lot of web applications and things like that were written with Python 2. So there's actually still quite a bit of applications out there that only work on Python 2.7, which is a very popular series. So you could see like Python 2.7 down here at the bottom. So if you're going to use a Python 2 series for whatever reason, you probably should use 2.7. But here I'm just going to go ahead and modify and make sure. One of the things I want to make sure you guys do is to make sure that you have this thing added to your path so that it actually runs. And this is where you want to make sure you say add Python to your environment variables. That needs to be checked because if it's not, you're going to have a bad time and then just click install. So you can see I already had it installed, like it, nothing changed there. If everything goes correctly though, you're gonna be able to open up a command prompt and you're gonna be able to type in Python and it's gonna run the Python emulator. And I'm gonna make this bigger. So inside of here, we can actually write our Python code. Hey guys, what's up? So if that is working correctly, then you can proceed to the next video. If not, you need to look at how to add Python to your path and you need to restart your computer because sometimes, uh, depending on your operating system, it may need a restart in order to take effect. So try that if it's not working first before you try to troubleshoot beyond that. The next thing we need to do to get started with Python is download a text editor so that we can actually write our code into it and get helpful hinting and things like that to make our lives easier. Visual Studio Code is actually created by Microsoft. It's free to use and it's, um, it's cross-platform as well. So even if you're following along on a Linux or Mac environment, this still works. So uh, we're going to use this Visual Studio editor. It's, it's, just, it, it's really popular these days. So go ahead and just download it and we're going to run the executable. So now let's go ahead and run through the install. We're going to say yes, and we accept the terms, and we're just going to install it to the default location. 
And you can create the Visual Studio code on the Select Start menu. That's always helpful. I'll even create a desktop icon. And um, yeah, let me see. So yeah, we want to make sure it's added to the path as well. That's important. And then go ahead and install it. All right, so now that we've done that, let's go ahead and launch Visual Studio Code. And this is just going to give you a folder. I already have some projects and everything open. But we're going to go ahead and create a new folder. And we're going to put this under our projects. Uh, I have a tutorials folder that I put all my tutorials under. And I'm gonna, I am already have a Python. So we're going to say um, Python v2. Uh, wait, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I need to create that folder, obviously. Um, Python v2. All right, so now I'm gonna select that folder and this is gonna open up into the folder that we just created. So let's create our first Python program. We're gonna say new file and we're gonna call it hello.py. Now in Python, you could type your code into a actual text editor and it would work the same. Like if you said, you know what, um, this file is gonna be called, uh, I'm going to say it just we'll do the same print hello world all right and if i save this file just using notepad and i go to i'm going to go to my projects again tutorials python python v2 i'm just going to save it here but if i said you know what change it to all files and i say test.py I can actually uh, create a Python file. You can see I have the syntax highlighting and everything. Now you might not have this coloring and it may not even recognize it. So what we need to do is make sure you have the right extension installed. Click on this icon to your left that said it says extension and in here we're going to say Python. Now you're going to want to grab the biggest one uh, that has 12 million downloads and four and a half stars and you're going to go ahead and install this thing. You can see I already have an install but when you install it <clears throat> it's just going to restart. So make sure you install this plugin. Another thing you might want to do, um, well, yeah, this is really all we're going to need for this tutorial series. You're going to see some squiggly lines and things like that. Those are not errors. That's called linting, and linting is actually an optional thing. We can disable it if we don't want, um, and that's probably what we're going to do in this tutorial series because a lot of linting has to do with more advanced concepts and um, and coding habits and things like that that you would learn along the way, um, but this is a beginner course, and we don't want to really we don't really want to get misguided or uh, misdirected, you know, down like a, a side path that is just not necessary right now. So you can see in both cases, I was able to create a Python file, one using Visual Studio, and we'll even say this is using Visual Studio. All right, and then, um, you know, then we have this test. So with two different files, now, if we want to run our program, what I want to do is make sure I have the file that I want running selected. I'm going to click this little debugger icon. And then when I click play for the first time, you're going to have these configurations. And by default, it's going to add a new configuration. But we can just select add configuration and click play. This is going to ask you what type of environment you want. And it should detect that you have the Python environment installed. It's going to look for Python on your path. So if, if Python can be found by Windows on your path, then this should work just fine. You're going to you're going to select Python. And then here you can see that um, in a moment it's compiling, it's running and things like that. And then you can see it does a lot of like uh, basically just like warnings and like logging and, and just information that you might be interested in. You can actually disable that as well, but this is just running right here. Um, and the debug console is probably the best thing to look at if you're just trying to get the output. But if you wanted to get feedback from what's going on behind the scenes, uh, the terminal is the place to go. But look at the debug if you're just looking for any sort of print, you know console output and things like that. Um, so you can see this is Visual Studio. If I go back to my file, I select the other one. I can run it just the same by clicking play. And obviously I'm going to select Python again. And then you can see that it says hello world. So it's pretty annoying to have to select your debug um, option every time you want to run the program. And, and that's really not what you want. So we want to make sure that we uh, click this this option and make sure the add configuration option and then if you select python it's going to create this new directory with this vs code with a launch.json file 
And this is like, this is like where it, you can set it up to actually run Django projects and it gives you starter code to how to get started with Django. So basically when you're running from Visual Studio, you can pass in arguments and things like that to your Django application so that it does a uh, certain, so it behaves in a certain way. So there's all kinds of different configuration options here. We're going to press control uh, S to save that config. Go back to our hello.py and now if we have our debug option, we can go ahead and select one of these. You can just say Python current file. That's probably the easiest thing to do, but you have all these other options too if you're trying to run like a Flask or Django project. So let's go ahead and just press play. And now you can see it constantly is just like, we can just run play over and over again. You don't have to select it over and over and all that stuff. So, so that's pretty cool. So now with this cool Visual Studio Editor extension that we installed, it, it's Python is actually telling you about all these different little tiny things. It's like new line missing and stuff like that. So those are like tiny little things. But if you wanted to satisfy them, it's it's just telling you, hey, you need a new line uh, right here. And then it's saying that you need a final new line. So like something like that, at least one. If I press Control S, some of these error messages start going away, at least that one. Um, even if I were to say, um, just if I click on this little green icon, it also gives you the uh, the information as to what the error message is. So there's multiple places you can go. So if we want to change the behavior of this so that we're not getting all these different like uh, nitpicky messages back, I want to go to File, Preferences, Settings, and this is where I have a few settings. This is where the Python linter is enabled and things like that. So you can see. Uh, I have a special Django plugin because like th there's different linting rules that you want to follow for Django versus other things. Uh, and that's why that's in there. But you can just add different settings. Uh, I even have TypeScript settings and stuff like that. Make sure there's always commas after every new setting that you're adding. And one of the things I want to do, there's actually, so I already have a py, uh, pylint args for this, uh, this Django one. So it's just a, um, it's just a list of string values and we're going to touch on, on those in just a moment but I'm going to go ahead and add this other value and remove this duplicate title um, so now we have I'm only concerned with problems that would result in the error of the file not compiling or running so that is uh, that is a much better user setting I think for just people that are just getting started so again like the nitpicky stuff you don't see the warning messages but if you end up doing something like uh, some sort of keyword that doesn't exist and press save then you're gonna see that the problem still exists it's like undefined variable we have no idea what that is like you're trying to call this as like a function it has no idea what it is um, but yeah so that's what you want and that's what we're gonna do alright guys thanks for watching we'll be back in the next video all right, guys, so this video series is by Practical Example, and uh, I had a video series that I did on Python back in 2016 that was quite popular, but I started the series off with like giving some practical examples, and I think that was really the, the, the popular part of that series, but then I kind of went astray with just kind of focusing on syntax and showing all the different built-in types in Python, and uh, and I was showing like things that like weren't really you know practically used all that often, and like um, it just like kind of just doesn't really captivate the audience anymore. So that like I'm trying to like at least lead by um, some sort of programming example problem or whatever that we're trying to solve when we discuss the different uh, types and um, things that you're going to do inside the Python language. So the first thing we want to do is focus on the string. This is actually a string value right here. So if we were to put this inside a variable, and we'll call this my variable. In Python, you're going to see commonly that local variables um, typically have, they're, they're all underscore with this, um, they're separated by the underscore, they're all lowercase. A lot of, a lot of Python uh, code is written in that way. The linting is going to give you hints as well as, as, as far as how to write properly. So if you want to go ahead and disable and, and put it back to its original uh, setting, you can do that. But by convention, we're going to just name uh, our variables in this way, all lowercase, all words separated with an underscore. And we could say this is a string. So a string in Python, um, it's going to look at this variable. It's going to assign a memory slot for it, and then it's going to assign memory to hold data uh, that it contains. It's also going to listen for any changes that are made to that variable so that... Um, 
it can end up stamping out a new object with that new value. And if we wanted to actually use the variable instead of this hard-coded string right in there, we could do that and we could say my variable and we're gonna print that to the screen. So if we go ahead and run this, we're gonna see in the debug console, this is a string. So it works the exact same way, but Python has a built-in. I can go ahead and see the type of, or just type, actually type of is JavaScript. So I could say type and then um, inside a parenthesis after the type, because this is actually a built-in function within Python, it, you can see that it's class type, takes in an object or name, um, and, all, and that's what we're passing in right here. So it's gonna, that's the first argument, that's the only one we're, that we're worried about. Those other two arguments are optional, but you could read more about you know passing in those arguments and seeing what your results are and things like that if you wanted to. But for right now, I just want you know what it is, what type of variable is my variable is it a string or is it something else in python so if i run this in the debug console you can see that is a class string so that tells you there's this built-in class within python that is a string and you're like what is it? and if you were really nerdy and wanted to read up on this you could actually go pick your uh, version of python 3.6 and you can see that there is all this documentation on the official python.org website this is all the nitty gritty details. So if you really want to be like a, a you know thick glasses nerd Python developer, like reading through all the semantics of, of all this stuff, like you're going to learn a ton about the language and what you can do. You're not going to use half of it probably, but um, it's all there for you. So if you ever wanted to like give, okay, there's some sort of built-in class within Python called String, uh, and that and that's the case. So you would never want to create your own class called you know str. Um, because Python has these built-in classes already. So uh, th those are like the, 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 the most important concepts around some of these um, features and like even the lesser known features that, that you might not deal with like range operators and things like that, um, which you do kind of deal with those a lot. But um, th it, it, just as an example, say you didn't, <laughs> then th th you, you would still want to be aware of those, uh, those edge cases so that you're not like overwriting some of the you know, core language of the Python uh, runtime or whatever. So anyway, linting also would, will help you with that as well, maybe even the compiler. So let's go ahead and look at a few other types real quick because I want to show you how to practically use the string type, but let's go ahead and create just some other type. We're going to say other type. What is this? I'm going to assign a number to it. So in Python, that's all you have to do. You don't have any semicolons or anything like that, like if you've ever seen JavaScript or other languages. None of that stuff matters within Python. Um, and now let's go ahead and like we're going to look at the type of other type. One of the things that Visual Studio Code gives you, which is really cool, is it gives you this code hinting. So like anytime it pops up like that, you can use um, just the tab key and it's going to pre-fill what it is that it thinks you, you want to type. And that's like nine times out of ten, that's usually what you want to type. So having a text editor like this is really cool. Um, now in the debug console, you can see that's a class of int. So we have this integer type. Um, let's see another type equals like, what if I said 1.4, what is this? You can double click and to select the whole thing, tab again, press play. And you can see that we have this now floating type. All right. So there's all these different types within Python. We're not going to discuss all of them, but the fact that the, the thing I really want to explain is that like we have, um, <clears throat> we'll just say one int equals one, two, int equals two. <clears throat> and I'm gonna get rid of these real quick. And what if I wanted to say um, one int plus two int, and then just print that out, press play. You can see that we're still getting a type of int. So we can actually add two variables together and we can still get their type of. Let's go ahead and get their value by removing that type statement in the parentheses and make sure you do that. Another thing too is that if you highlight over the um, the start debugging option, I thought it was gonna give you a hint, but you could press F5 if you wanted to and it's gonna start the debugger uh, automatically. So you get the value of three. Now what happens if you try to do something that's not mathematically possible and that's try to take, uh, let's just say this is not possible. So we're trying to take a string and we're gonna add it to an int. So we have two different types within Python. And we go ahead and press play. You can see that we get this 
error and it says unsupported operand and you cannot add an int and a string that's not mathematically possible it doesn't make sense this isn't a mathematical value it doesn't represent anything and you're trying to combine the two as if they do so Python's going to freak out on you whenever you try to deal with two different types like that the interesting thing about JavaScript is we could do the same thing one and equals one and then two and equals this is not possible and then we could say uh, just go ahead and add one int plus two int and you could see it adds uh, two different types it doesn't complain that's because JavaScript is a weakly type language Python is a strongly typed language a lot of people think Python is like some sort of weakly type language like Perl or PHP or um, or JavaScript but it's not it is strongly typed it enforces those types and makes sure that you, if you want to do that you have to explicitly try to do that so like in this case I'm gonna say you know what to int I'm gonna force you to be an int so I could say int and this is called type casting what we're doing is we're taking the type of string and we're casting it to a different type of int and we're gonna to try to force Python to behave in that way but now you're gonna see that we're gonna get this invalid literal for int with base 10 basically Python and its built-in int type is expecting actual numbers that the com computer understands it's getting string values that it doesn't understand as numbers so this is simply not going to work ever Python is going to prevent that type of bullshit from ever occurring whereas you know these weekly type languages like Python or not Python, but PHP, JavaScript, and uh, and Perl and things like that. They will just let you do it. This, they won't complain about it. That is one of the main reasons why <clears throat> companies do not use a language like that. Most of the time, you're never going to want to do some crazy stuff like that. But in this case, you're forcing Python to try to do it, and it still doesn't understand it. So... It, it, like those other languages shouldn't understand it either but it, it just goes it just tries to figure it out and it auto magically figures it out for you and if you've ever heard of the term magic with a framework and things like that that's what that's what they're talking about like you know magic that goes on behind the scenes ultimately there's some sort of decision by a developer who was developing javascript or Perl or whatever to say you know what we have these type collisions don't even care force one or another into it you know what i mean like so they know that like in JavaScript, you can't obviously force a string into an actual number, so it's going to go the opposite way, and it's going to force a number into a string. So, uh, but that it's just weird behavior. So anyway, th let's go ahead and talk about a practical thing that we can do with a Python string. We're going to actually write a simple HTML page, and we're going to say uh, the thing's going to have everything that an HTML page needs. There's going to be a title in here test page we're gonna close off the title so just try to follow along with what I'm typing here it's all just regular HTML so hopefully it's familiar to you and then we'll just say hello world let's close off our body tag and close off our HTML tag and now we can go ahead and close that off and we're gonna go ahead and it's, instead of printing to the screen I mean what we're not going to do that. We're actually going to create an out file. So we're going to say my out file equals, and we're going to say open. Look for a file that is called test and the current directory. And if it doesn't exist, go ahead and uh, open it. We're going to make sure that the test is dot, and we're going to call this index. Actually, we're going to call it index.html. So it's an index.html file extension. This dot says go back to, uh, to our root directory uh, or the current directory that this file is sitting in forward slash and it's going to create this index file this word this w says uh write to it um and open it like create it if it does not exist now sometimes you're still going to get these error messages where like it's the linter is stuck so you're going to want to just press Control s so that the linter uh, will go away from its uh error messaging so what you can see is if we go ahead and we try to run this program And we go to our directory you can see that it created the index.html file but there's nothing in there but that's pretty cool that python actually created an actual html file if i go to where my directory is located i can go ahead and double click on that file and you can see that it's actually opening up this page into a web browser so that's pretty cool
So now I want to show you that we can go ahead and alter this program to say, you know what, after you go ahead and create the file, I want you to go ahead and write to it. And if I go ahead and say dot after my variable name, um, you can see that we have all these different options that we, we can read a file. But what I'm going to do is say write. I want to actually write, and I'm going to write my variable value into it. So we're going to write our string value, which is actually an HTML page uh, with this content. So we should get a page title in there. Uh, and also a hello world tag and everything like that. So if we go ahead and we run this, then we can do that. Go back to our files, double click the uh, page. You can now see that our index actually has the value, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we can also reveal in the Explorer and then double click on it, and you can see that we have an actual HTML web page, which is pretty cool. Python gener generated it for you just like that. So you could have had whatever sort of value inside of here as your HTML. Maybe it's a a file that you open up and you like inject all that but this is uh, is all is all you really need so you could have this index file sitting on, a, on an apache server somewhere and, and you could deliver it to the entire internet you know and, and um it's just as simple as that so even without databases and things like that like you could literally set up something so basic where it's like i have an apache web server and I run a Python script that writes a bunch of HTML files based on like data that I scrape across the web or whatever. And then I write these HTML files, not even to a database, but to a straight file system on the Apache web server. And it could just literally like serve static HTML uh, displaying the data that, that you've, you know, that you've assembled and things like that. And nowadays with like client side, uh, you know, these, these serverless uh, servers that, that, that they're talking about, that's, that's all they really are. And, uh, and they make a lot of sense because you could pass down a lot of code, including JavaScript and all kinds of stuff, down to the client that is just like rendering most of the UI, if not the entire UI. And uh, and all that thing is doing is just making like maybe Ajax calls out to some sort of RESTful endpoint. That could be like a Python Flask server or something like that. And it's just passing data back and forth. Like literally you could start an entire operation with just Python code. So the thing about being a good coder is that like we have to be able to tap into the code that is actually written by people that actually know more than we do. So you never want to reinvent the wheel in programming. And a lot of the code that we need to tap into to do a lot of the things that we need to do has already been written for us. So being a good developer in a lot of ways is actually how to assemble tools, how to learn quickly, and how to actually know which tools to use, um, which just comes with experience. And unfortunately, you can't really fast track that. But you could do a lot of blogging, uh, you know, as far as reading blogs or vlogs, you know, following on my channel, things like that, like to try to keep up to date with everything. But it's going to be impossible. You'll find that it's impossible to keep up with everything. And uh, just experience over time, you just you accumulate way more than you thought possible. But uh, it's just a timing thing. So let's go ahead and look at how we can actually use somebody else's code, like an actual library. We're going to create a new file. And we're just going to call it, um, we'll just call it module imports.py. So if we want to install something that we can use uh, from other people's code sources, we can go to the command line. And it doesn't matter where you are in the command line, but I can say pip install request hyphen HTML. Now this is a project that was written by the Python request people. But it actually has JavaScript support and all kinds of different stuff. So if you ever try to reach across the web to grab, um, you know, HTML or like you know, you know, scrape a web page for some data or something like that, this is a great tool to use. And we're going to see how to use it in just a second. So we need to go ahead and import it. And to do that from Python, you always, you need to say from, and then what it is that you're actually uh, requesting, and then you're going to say uh, import the actual thing that you want to use. So like the request HTML is the module library. And then from that module library, we're trying to get one piece of it, which is called HTML session. And then we're going to use that session object um, or the, really the session class that we're, that we're importing to new up an object that we're going to call session. And just to let you know that uh, we can see what type of object it is, we're going to go ahead and say print uh, session. Uh, and before... Let's actually go ahead and see what the output is if we try to print the session to the screen. And we'll see whether or not we can even do that actually. So you can see that you get um, the 
there's some sort of session object and this is the actual object stamped out in memory this is like where in the memory location you could find this object that is called html session um, if i wanted to say the type i could do the same thing just print the type of it And you can see that it is a class. It tells you it's some sort of class called request HTML.html session. So again, you're importing just a class on this HTML module. You're newing up an object from that class. And this is all object-oriented programming in Python. And then we want to go ahead and new up another object, um, which is really going to be a string variable that we're going to call session.get. Actually, this may not be a string. Uh, but now I, I want to do the session.get. I can go ahead and just give an HTML page. I'm going to give a page to a website that I own so that way I don't get any, um, I don't get in any trouble for like sending a bunch of traffic to somebody else's website. So now if I wanted to go ahead and um, like tell me what, like I'm going to go ahead and just print the value of R. So you can get this response 200. So in HTML or HTTP uh, actually, which is Hypertext uh, Transfer Protocol, the responses that you get back, like 200 is a good response, uh, 404 is page not found. A lot of people are familiar with that, but this is what you're gonna get back by default. So you could actually say if our, um, you know, if, if you're checking for a response of 200, but let's go ahead and just print something else out. If you wanted to, you could say dot and you get this uh, text highlighting, this text helping. So if I wanted to get the actual text of the page and print that out to the screen, I'm actually going to get much more data coming back. And you can see I actually get the HTML. It's all formatted properly for me and everything. But it's the HTML uh, homepage of my website. You can see all that stuff in there. Um, it's a really ugly website at the moment, but it's just, it, it's always under active development. I don't really do anything with it anymore. But, um, that's the story behind that. But if I wanted to say, you know what, I'm not interested in all that text. I just want all the links on the page because I'm going to go ahead uh, and I want to see how many links there are. And I'm going to like maybe scrape all the, the links and start following those links, you know, because like we could uh, we could do all kinds of crazy stuff. So here's our our output. So you can see it doesn't find any links on the page, but that's because we didn't reference it right. The thing we need to do is we need to say, you know what? Instead of all that text, which is HTML, I want to say, you know what, get me the HTML and then get me the links. This is going to use a built-in library. I believe this is using Beautiful Soup. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's using Beautiful Soup. But now when I run this, um, because I said HTML, it's going to parse through all the HTML looking for any sort of links that it can find. Now, most likely because it's using Beautiful Soup, that's why it's really slow. But now if we look at um, the the uh, debug console, you can see the only thing that we're getting is we're getting anything on the page that are links. So you can see that we have these full spelled out links and then we have these relative links. Um, but those are all the links on the home page. So I could actually um, like assign those out to something like a list type. And a list type we haven't seen too much of, but we'll say my list of links equals in Python, you use these square brackets. So if I wanted to actually say, you know what, I'm going to uh, assign all those links to my list of links. I'm going to say, um, instead of uh, assigning it to an empty list, I'm actually going to assign it to this value. And then we can go ahead and we can print this, my list of links. So the value type that gets returned here is actually a little bit unique. Um, one of the reasons why, if we look at, um, if we hover over it, you can see that it returns a type of set. So set is very similar to a list in Python. And we're going to talk about all three of these different types very, uh, all in one video here. My list is, I, you use square bra brackets, right? If you want to add an element to my list, I can simply say my list.append um, inside of these uh, parentheses, I can just say, uh, string value. That's fine. I'm going to append a string value, uh, just a string that has this name. In fact, let's just make it a little bit more interesting. I'll just say it has my name. And now if I want to go ahead and print my list, I can go ahead and do that. So another really common, uh, really important thing I, I want to show you guys is that 
I can set breakpoints on my program using Visual Studio Code so that I can inspect certain things like um, my list. So if I say print uh, type of my list, I mean, I can put breakpoints wherever I want and I can stop the execution. So if I press play now, I'll actually hit my, my code here and like you can see it gives you all kinds of information on these variables and we talked about all these different variables variables that we have and you can look at, at like my list of links is this variable and you can see okay what is it if I highlight over it it looks very similar to a list again it's um the point is you can find all kinds of information here's our R object so you can see all the information that we have available to that so we could say uh, if we wanted to go from one page to the next, you can see that there's this cookie jar in there. There's all kinds of stuff in there that we can uh, interact with. And here's our HTML. So you can see all that HTML code that we printed out to the screen. There's our HTML. Here's our links. Um, here's LXML. So if we wanted to parse through using uh, actual XML syntax, we can scrape the web using that. There's certain JavaScript and things that we can inject onto this object. So it's a very, there's a ton of code written around all this that we didn't have to write. And the point is, is that using the right tools for the job is is like half the battle. So I want to keep going down. If I want to if I want to go to the next line of code, you can see I have these different options where I can step over, step into, step out of. So I'm just going to go ahead and F10 to go to the next line. And now you can see that if we look over here, we have this my list, uh, and it's an it's it's an empty uh, list of values. And lists in Python actually keep their order. So that's one of the main reasons why you'd want to use a list. Lists are also very flexible. So lists in Python are types that can um, they can hold an infinite a number of like strings or um, numbers. They can hold other lists. So you can have lists that hold lists that hold lists inside of them. So you can have very complicated like tree data structures using lists, and you can actually take values in and out of them. So um, they're more memory intensive because you can do that. Now sets actually cannot have duplicates, so they're very similar to a list. That's why. This my list of links looks very similar to some sort of array or list, um, but if there were duplicates in in here, it would not allow them to go in. So that's the big difference. So if you don't don't care about duplicates, another thing is too, this is um, uh, just automatically ordered. So it's not it's just ordered based on whatever. So in this video, what we want to look at is um, how do we get past this error message because we can't go through our list of uh, of links there because some of them are relative. And what I mean by that is if we if we looked at those values, some are just forward slash, which means relative to the hipster code domain. And other ones were fully spelled out URLs that Python requests could make sense of just fine that had its proper schema, which means it included an HTTP uh, in there. So that's what it's really looking for. So what we want to do is we want to look at a few things here. Number one, we're going to look at commenting out code. So I don't want this code to run, so I just want to highlight the code portion and if I press control forward slash it's going to automatically inject and turn these things green Python comments actually start with this uh, pound sign so anything after that's going to be ignored by the compiler um, so you can put whatever sort of comments to give yourself whatever sort of notes on your um, your code that you want for right now I'm just commenting out because I don't want it to run and now we're going to look at the logical operator that says you know what um, we want to look at the uh, the if operator. So what we could easily do in our list, we could just say, you know, if we're going to say if HTTP in item, which is the, the value in the list, and we saw once again that, um, you know, we, it, it, we go through every list item in there, and we're looking for the value of HTTP and whether or not it exists. And if it does, we're going to say, you know what, print the item to the screen. So now every time this runs, I'm going to put a breakpoint on this print screen so we can see every time that there's a match that that it works. Now this part, don't worry about the linting rules. You can see that it's just, it's just bullcrap linting stuff. But anyway, we're going to press control save and this thing should still run just fine. And again, a lot of those linting errors go away when you actually press save. So now let's go ahead and now we stopped it on the if. So we're like this this login, and let's see where we are in my list. So we're at login. So we're at the first value, right? Which is login. So we know login has no HTTP in there. So this this print statement's not going to get hit, right? So now we're on the next item, and this is one that does contain the HTTP. So let's see if we actually print it out to the.
console and hit that next line and we do see because we matched it said oh it contains http it went ahead and it, it's going to print it out to the console if we let it proceed and there it is and let's go ahead and remove these breakpoints and check our logic and make sure it goes through and only does that ready and there you go those are all the links that are fully spelled out so those are only the links that, that we want to get using this code that we had before so i can press control uh, or just right click cut and instead of doing this i can go ahead and paste this in here and then um, select it all and once again control forward slash and it actually uncomments it out and now we can say we're only going to append this huge text of values or whatever uh, for these proper urls And you know what, I probably, I want to go ahead and print at the outside of our, all of our four statements, I'm going to go ahead and print the value of our huge string. So I actually want to see that after the list is run and all that stuff, because this is all procedural, it's all read top to bottom, left to right. Eventually this is going to be hit when it's all done, and I want to see what that value is. Because we're not doing anything with it, so as soon as we hit this code right here, the... Um, yeah, the, the values uh, are gone because we've killed the, the program. So because I have a lot of visual, uh, like a video processing going on, and also because Visual Studio Code is actually relatively slow when you have a lot of stuff going on, um, that's one of the downsides. So you will see, like, especially on like when we're appending a huge string like this, it's going to slow down a little bit. But there it is. Like we just requested all that HTML stuff. And we just made it, you know, we printed it out to this huge thing. But what if I wanted to go ahead and say, you know what, I want to go ahead and um, use my code from where we were using this out file here. And we're just going to copy this out file code right here. And I'll put in the module imports. And instead of printing the huge screen, the I mean, huge uh, string, I'm going to write the huge string uh, to, we're just going to say test dot txt so we want it to be a test.txt file instead because it's not going to be valid html since we're just jumping or uh, bundling one html thing on top of another uh, let's go ahead and launch this so our program launches and because there's less going on hopefully um, there's definitely the video processing still going on but since we're not generating such a large string and trying to keep it in memory inside the Visual Studio Editor, it might be a little bit faster. So when we go ahead and try to execute our code, what we're going to get is this character encoding error. And um, what it is, is it's run into this new thing that does not, it's like a, a Unicode error that, that Python cannot write. That basically this, this uh, so we need to encode it to UTF-8 to at least force it to work. And this part is where we have to do a little bit of crazy string casting. We have to say, you know what, I'm going to cast to a string the value that get it gets returned from huge string dot encode and then I say you know what I want to encode it to proper UTF-8 and then I need another parenthesis so there's a lot going on here but basically what we're saying is that this is going to return bytes of data and we need to convert it to a string so that because write only works with an actual value of uh, a string that gets passed in so it won't work with anything else so you can't just simply say huge string dot encode and think that that's going to work this is uh, where we get, have to get crazy into our little typecasting. But by doing that, if we go ahead and we run the program, we're forcing Python to go ahead and encode anything it doesn't understand the UTF-8, and it's going to ignore the errors. Um, and then when it does that, you can see that there's no complaints. If we go over to our file, we now have this test.txt, and we are able to effectively take the values of uh, five or six different web pages, and we combined it all into one text file, and it took about a second. So it reached across the web. The value is all dynamic. Every time you run the program, you're going to get different values, obviously, depending on whatever's going on on the websites that you're requesting data from. So there's all kinds of stuff, like I said, you could do to just even build. Um, just even in this tutorial series right here, it showed you that you can actually reach across the web. You can grab data. You can write to files. You can even take those files and make your own HTML files with it. And then from there, you can throw those files on a web server somewhere, and you can have a website. And, and, and all by doing so without any database, not saying that's your best architecture, not saying you're going to start Facebook that way, but simply put, like a lot of small one-man operations and things like that could have pretty you know, dynamic and interesting looking websites, especially portfolio websites and such. 
that are just running on you know some sort of uh, you know just Apache server serving up raw HTML that was generated by Python or some other tool. Um, and that's actually taken for us a storm lately where like the serverless stacks that you see written in like uh, Go and other languages and ult- ultimately they're just, you know, Python, they're, they're just code that are generating HTML pages and such. And like, instead of, um, and, th- and so you could just do that yourself really is what I'm, what I'm saying, but, um, or it, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> So what if we were like, you know what, this huge string isn't very usable. You can't obviously combine all those HTML files together. What if I said, you know what, I want to create separate HTML files for every one of them. Well, you could easily do that, and you would actually do that inside of your if statement where you'd actually say instead of huge string r.text, what I can do is I can say I'm going to paste this in here. I'm going to say, you know, open this file. But what I want to do is have this file name be dynamic because the problem is is that Every time you get this match, it's going to overwrite this file. So you need to have a dynamic file name uh, every time that occurs. So there's a built-in way that that we can do this in Python where we can get the index um, passed there. So we can say, you know, item and index, and we're going to say in, and we're going to use a built-in enumerate function. And enumerate, we just have to enumerate the list. But by doing so, we can keep track of this index value. And now I can say, you know what, test, and I'm going to say plus index plus, now I'm closing it off. So this is how we're doing something called string concatenation, or, or concatenation, where it's where we're taking two strings, we're actually taking three, we're taking one string, two strings, three strings, and we're combining it into one string. Um, so that's what we're doing there. Now we're also going to out file right, and um, now we're going to have the ability to have this, you know, test one, test two, test three, or whatever index number this value shows up in. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. And now instead of huge string, we actually need to say that we're going to be looking at the r.text. And we want to encode that as well. So now by doing that, let's go ahead and run this. Now this is where you get the two, um, you get the, the string problem. See, the thing is that index is a type of number. So like, let me go ahead and pause this real quick and I can show you guys. So we haven't looked at the number type too much, but index is an actual number. So if I, if I hover over it when we actually hit our breakpoint, All right, so now if I look at the, uh, Oh, that's interesting. So we have this actually backwards. So the, the thing is, is the index and then the value. So I, sorry, I don't totally jacked that up. So anyway, I'm not perfect. Th- this is your index, and then this is going to be your new item. So that, that makes sense. Now, however, there's still a problem. Index is a number. So in number, you're trying to add a number to a string, and Python might not like that. So you're going to want to cast that directly to a string. And by doing so, we can now say, you know, I'll even put an underscore to make it prettier. So we can say test underscore one, test underscore two, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or whatever the index number is for the match that we have. All right, so let's go ahead and run this again. All right, so now we get no error messages. And once again, you have where those values showed up. Uh, so now we have test one, test two you know, all this stuff. So now it's like, well, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I, I want the actual straight HTML page. Can I get that? Well, you can, we can do that. So let's go ahead and um, go back over here and we're going to say, you know, instead of writing a text file, I want you to write an HTML file. And instead of encoding and all this other stuff, let's go ahead and just simply write um, the uh, r.html. And let's see if we can get encoding errors from what is being returned from that HTML function that's attached to the built-in HTML request object that we were working on. So now it's like HTML dot, dot two. Um, so I guess I can't get it. So I have to just get the raw text. Let's see if the raw text, um, yeah, so that, that's, that kind of sucks. Okay, so we're gonna have the character encoding problem on all this crap. All right, whatever. So we're going to encode this thing and uh, we're going to save it as a .html. So we're going to see what kind of malformed HTML we end up getting here.
So if you look at the output of the files, if we double click on those, you can see that we are getting these different test files and stuff. Like if we go to test zero, uh, that is that Twitter link that we found. Now we obviously have like we're missing style sheets and stuff because you can't request on a local file all the files and everything that Twitter needs in order for this thing to work. But um, there you have it. So that, that's that's how you could dynamically go through some lists, uh, sets, or tuples to just go through values and request one thing after another. We looked at logical operators that basically said if something is, you know, if some string exists inside of a string, do this. If not, just, you know, don't do anything. So we've looked at those logical operators, and that's actually really what programming is all about. We also saw in this that we had some character encoding issues. And, like, um, because we're using this this uh, library, not HTML parser, I actually tried to use that real quick. But um, because we're using this HTML session object, which is a part of its own library, there are certain things that this code is doing that if you wanted F12, you could actually go into it. You could press F12 and it'll take you right into the code. And you can see that there's quite a bit of code here, but uh, it's doing quite a bit of stuff. And uh, you'd have to spend a lot of time reading through the source code of this project. But there's certain things that it does, like looks at the character encoding that's declared inside of the HTML page. And if none exists, it's going to try to do the like default ISO format and like a lot of pages are in UTF-8 so anyway you're going to end up having the page blow up on the encoding especially when you try to uh, write it out as just a regular string so you have to have it properly encoded to a string that um, that, that write command understands with Python so Python's always been a little bit of a challenge with uh, character encoding and UTF-8 and things like that but um, we did see you know how we could force it to be uh, UTF-8 encoded um, so that that is how you kind of get around that but you really need to research okay why is request um, using this default, what should it be, things like that. So you have to add more logic to your program itself to look at the content headers and everything. But because this is a beginner course, we're not going to get into all this, you know, complex Python code. This is stuff that might take you years, if not, you know, five years to actually truly understand how to read something like this and truly grasp, you know, how to extend it and make it better and things like that. Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, what we want to look at is um, our code logical operators that we had before. There's a lot more complication that you can do with this uh, this if statement inside of Python. I'm going to clean up all these test files here. I don't actually want them cluttering up my workspace. So I'm going to remove those to the recycle bin. Uh, I'll get rid of this big text file as well. These are all from the previous videos. We're going to create a new file that we're just going to call if elif.py. Now, a lot of times, like, you're going to have quite a bit of complication when it comes to, like, okay, uh, for instance, like, if you wanted to build a, a program that, like, asks a bunch of questions and stuff like that, uh, then, you, then yeah, we could easily do that. So let's go ahead and look at how to build a, an actual program that's going to take in some values. So it'll say, um, Let's go ahead and say, you know, let, let's, to keep our program running, all we have to do is we could just say while true, and this has to be capitalized. That just keeps the program running literally indefinitely until you run out of power or the end of the world occurs or your computer dies, uh, but it'll go forever. And we can go ahead and create this question object that we're going to say uh, the value equals, we're going to say raw input, and then we just ask the question. We're going to say, like, what is your favorite language? All right, so now that we've asked that, um, we, we can assign that to the question. And then we're just going to say while true. Um, let me show you how we can get we can crash the program. We're going to say print the question. Now, th this is just going to continue to be like an infinite loop, like I said. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So my days with Python go way back to Python 2.0, but if you're following in Python 2, then you are going to use raw input. But nowadays, it's just uh, input for Python 3. So if I say, uh, I'm going to ask, what is their favorite language? And I go ahead and run this thing. So let's go ahead and add some logical operators to this statement here. So instead of just printing the question, having the thing go over and over again, we can actually say, you know what? If uh, question equals Python, then we could say, print you are awesome all right so we're going to do that and then i also i want to import a library that we can use a lot in python which is called import sys and um, after the print statement i want to go ahead and just say sys uh sys if i could dang it if i could type 
exit is it exit yeah i think it's exit all right good so sys.exit and this will actually be able to bounce out of the program if they say that uh they like python so let's go ahead and run it is this thing running what are you doing all right let's restart it now it's running what is your favorite language python oh you are awesome now it exits out of the program so that's how you could do that now let's look at how we can do elif so let's say say elif question equals so they put in the response of uh, ruby right and we'll say print ruby sucks compared to python and then we can also do sys.exit or you know what we'll just keep bouncing around until they can say you know what i want you to basically say python else equals we'll say c sharp and i'll make that lowercase just to make all this lowercase and we'll say print c sharp is not as good as python clearly i'm trolling i actually like c sharp a lot um, but anyway these um these give you some different you know outcomes and everything based on what they're typing uh, but only if you type python does it actually exit out of the infinite loop because everybody should love python right um so what's your favorite language ruby ruby sucks compared to python ruby ruby sucks compared to python ruby um, let's try C sharp. Now we get the C sharp message. And then if we try something else, we just get the same message over and over again. So let's go ahead and do a fail safe on that. So we're just going to say the final L if. So by the way, if you don't know, the if is just going to go if, okay, do that. If the, you could just have it over and over again and say if, 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 but L if actually lets you understand. It's like, I expect it to say, okay, if it's this, then do this, or if not do that. It, it basically it's, it's, it's indicating that you need to do something like, we don't just want, it's not just if else, like typically if it's not if or else, it's some other if else kind of thing. And that's really what if, L if is doing for you. The final thing you can have on the end is just else. And this is going to be our, our fail safe and just say, you suck balls. Or, you know, I shouldn't say that. Just say you suck. All right. So because it doesn't understand, I'm freaking out. I don't understand what you mean. So obviously our program is not very good because it only understands uh, three commands. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. Um, but let's go ahead and run it. So we have it. What's your favorite language? Now if I type something else, I'm freaking out. I don't understand what you mean. And if I type Python, we go back and we have you are awesome. So you could create a program in this same fashion that all you do is like it this is how you would create a command line program so basically when they type uh python you, instead of just printing out to a screen you would actually execute some sort of like you know python specific script or some script related to what it is that they typed in and that is that is really all programming is it's forks and logic it says you hit a you hit a fork in the road are you going left or right this isn't quantum mechanics you can't go in both directions or exist simultaneously or whatever eventually we're going to get there with quantum computing we're not there yet it's either one or the other so we're it's all atomic <laughs> um anyway thanks for watching so in this uh video i just want to show you that python has a built-in pi game library so if you ever wanted to build basic video games you can actually do that in python and just this simple um you know little bit of code here that that has been written I just want to show you what they're able to do with the Pi game, Pi game uh, library. And by the way, this I just want to give credit to where this video is. It can be found freely on this website over here. Uh, but it's a great way of learning and just seeing how how quickly you know people are able to do things. And like here, you can see that these types are everything that we've talked about already. This is just a list of three integers. This is a list of three integers, and those are actually defining colors and things like that. Here's a list of two integers that are defining. Uh, the height and the width of the screen and this is calling built-in functions within Pi game called display and set mode and it's passing in the size which is just a list of of two values and then here's like it's setting a uh, caption and it's passing in a string value so we've talked about all this stuff here's that range operator that I was telling you about which is basically like uh, it, it just it gives a start and an endpoint and um, yeah so you can see it's looping over 50 times using the range operator um, and each time it's actually calling this random function. And the random functions also, uh, believe it or not, random uh, behavior is actually very, very difficult to write code for because Python, uh, not just Python, but any computer science field is typically black or white. It's either, you know, uh, ones or zeros, right? So when you're, when you're writing stuff that like can just truly be random, it's never truly random with the current code bases and coding uh, and technology and mindsets that we have right now. So Eventually, I think with quantum mechanics, maybe we can start getting into that or quantum computing, but 
um, you know, things aren't truly random, but these random libraries are the best that we can do to date to try to come up with random numbers. And that's all that's going on here. But when I go ahead and I print, run play, this is going to open up a Pi uh, game window, and you can see that it's actually generating snowflakes, which is pretty cool. If we wanted to change the height and width, you just go in here and you start messing with some of the code. So I'm going to make this much bigger. In fact, let's do it 1280 uh, by 720. Make this thing HD. See if Pi game can support it. And you can obviously see his logic is only set up to use 400, so we'd have to figure out, okay, well, why is that? Well, we probably look down here. You can say, oh, look at the cap. It's at 400. What if I went ahead and I said, you know, this should be 1280, and then this should be 720. So now we have HD. Let's see if we have some better results. And now you can get basically the screen <clears throat> is like half size. I'm not sure what the, what's up with the 720 there. Uh, maybe the aspect ratios. I, I'm not sure, but let's let's make that double there. Or most likely, he's just got logic uh, sitting. So, oh yeah, it's right here. Look. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, so yeah, that, that that's the problem. It's only 400 in height down there. So let's go ahead and put this back to 720. I figured it wasn't that problem unless it was dynamically determining some sort of like uh, a different ratio or something. But here is where we want to bump that up to. 720 there and then this random range uh we'll probably put, we'll have to put it 720 as well uh right uh, control s to save it so now when i run the example i was able to quickly take what code he had i was able to adapt it and now i have a much bigger game so if i had a game with some sort of white snowy background or if this is like some sort of space with stars like a uh, gallic Galaga or whatever, uh, then this is where you would end up starting. But uh, again, give credit to where it's due. This was uh, this is coming out of the Simpson.edu. Um, so if you guys want to check out also this um, this uh, this link here, which is Programmer Arcade Games, and you can see all this different stuff. There's all these different examples of how to use the Pi Game Library to do different things. So you could build some basic uh, decent level games, but as far as cutting edge next level games with you know advanced 3D rendering and, and stuff like that, you're not really going to use Python for that, but um, you know, Python is good for some basic games.